Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, our newest episode of Gotham Sound TV. Um, I am very excited to be talking to Dr. Linda Dahl. Um, she is, as far as I know, one of the few uh, COVID compliance officers working in film that's also a medical doctor. Uh, hi, Dr. Dahl. Good hi. to see you. Um, welcome. And Thanks. Thank you for thank you for agreeing to be a part of this. I know people are very uh, excited to to uh, watch this and have lots of questions, and I have lots of questions. Um, I guess let's start at the beginning. Um, who are you, and and how did you get to be a COVID compliance officer? Um, I got so uh, my name is Linda Dahl. I'm an ear, nose, and throat doctor, and I got to be a COVID compliance officer because I lost everything I had <laughs> before. <laughs> this is a terrible way to say it, but I used to run a uh, pretty bu busy ear, nose, and throat practice in Midtown Manhattan, and I've been in practice for about 17 years. Um, and when the pandemic hit, I was treating you know hundreds of people. Um, I guess like 125 people a week in my practice and hundreds of whom had COVID. I had it myself in February. Um, and then with the shutdowns, um, most of my patients um, had no access to me and they, uh, a lot of people ended up leaving the city. Uh, and when weeks turned into months, um, I eventually um, had to shut down my practice because uh, the patients were gone and the overhead was really high and I ended up subletting out my office. Um, and then I was just kind of waiting, I think like everybody else, to try to figure out what to do next. Um, and one of my patient's um, wife uh, is a line producer and she contacted me and said, you know, there's this new role called a COVID compliance officer. We don't know what it is or who it would be, but, you know, since you're not doing anything, would you be interested? And I read through the job description and it looked like nothing I had ever done before <laughs> really knew how to do because uh, I'd never been on a television uh, production before. Um, but I did know a lot about COVID, I do know a lot about COVID and about treating upper respiratory infections. So um, there was a lot of kind of back and forth uh, with the the studio uh, that ended up hiring me. And then at the last minute, uh, she called me on a Thursday night and she said, okay, you're going to start Monday. And then I, I started that Monday. <laughs> that's kind of how it happened. Wow. That is a, uh, that's a whirlwind. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, now you, we were talking a little bit before it wasn't it was also the state came in and, and kind of shut down um, your ability to practice medicine. Is that, is that right? Yeah. I mean, it was, it was um, kind of surreal uh, because like I said, I had been treating patients January, February, March um, for all kinds of symptoms, a lot of uh, which turned out to be COVID. And even uh, when the tests finally became available, they were hard to come by. But when people started getting tests, they were testing positive for COVID. And I felt pretty secure in my ability to treat it, um, even though, you know, that we didn't really know what was going to happen with the virus. There were still a lot of treatments that were available. But um, then on March uh, 22nd, um, I'm in New York. So the governor of New York um, made it... Um, illegal for patients to see their doctors in person unless it was an emergency. So all of a sudden, everything I did had to be uh, through telemedicine, and I had no way of seeing my patients or testing them. I had no access to any of the tests um, or even, you know, working or seeing my patients in person. Um, and that just went, that went on until June 8th. Um, when they were finally allowed to come into the office, but with such severe restrictions that it made it really hard to even open. And a lot of my colleagues are now still trying to keep their practices opening um, open, and they're having a really hard time. So uh, you go from that situation to getting this job on a film set. Mm -hmm. uh, this was not your first time in entertainment necessarily, but was this your first time on a film set? And what was that like in, in terms of prep? Yeah, um, I was treating, a lot of my patients uh, came from Broadway. Um, and so I was used to uh, treating um, patients who had uh, to perform live. So it was a lot of really quick on the spot, you know, get a better really quickly treatments. And I was also, um, used to treating people who spread infections easily between them because um, theaters are really intimate places with pretty bad ventilation and they're kind of notorious for um, being 
places where people get sick often. I would joke that if um, Broadway wasn't so disgusting, I wouldn't have a job. <laughs> so it was a lot of a lot of uh, illnesses in the entertainment industry. But I had never been on a TV or film production before, um, and it so it was it was surreal to try to come up. Uh, to try to interpret all of the job description rules and the state rules and the union rules um, and implement them in a system um, that I had never seen before. It was really <laughs> surreal. Give, give me a sense of, of some of those conversations originally. I mean, who were they with and, and, and how did they start and what were they like? Um, well, over the summer, um, the unions uh, got together and created the safe way forward. Um, and then each production was tasked with coming up with their version of that. It was really more of a waiver to work because the um, studios um, hadn't gotten to an agreement with the union. So, you know, they everybody kind of wanted different things. Um, so they had to come up with a waiver for that. And then they also um, had to implement the state regulations. And so since we're in New York, they had to... Um, use, they had to follow the phase four reopening regulations that came from the state as well. So it was a lot of, you know, and then the producers were tasked with finding their own COVID compliance officers, which they all agreed didn't exist in nature because it was someone sort of medical, but also who knew production and could carry out safety protocols. Um, and yeah, it's really like three or four professions combined into one. Um, and so when I was reading through the job description about, you know, workspaces and safety management and OSHA compliance. I'm just like, I don't do that. <laughs> I don't know how to do that. Um, and then um, creating pods and zones and testing protocols and um, screening, you know, sort of like a public health thing. Um, that was also brand new to me. But but in terms of understanding the immune system and kind of what the underlying goal was, that was something I was really comfortable with um, and communicating with people you know, in all different sort of levels of um, power it was pretty, I was pretty comfortable with that too. And I think at this point we should talk about the nature of the specific job that you are asked mm -hmm. to supervise. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was um, asked to help complete production for a show that uh, a massive production it was actually a mini series, a television mini series. Um, and they were almost done shooting in March when they had to shut down with everybody else. So I think they had about, um, three weeks left of shooting. I think it was supposed to be two weeks originally. And then that got spread out to, to three weeks um, when we did finally start shooting. Um, and everything was just left um, in March. So they had one huge warehouse that had been built up that they finished filming in that had to be torn down. That was very expensive. So they were really wanted to get that torn down as soon as possible. And then there was another equally massive set on another stage um, that they had to do most of the filming with a couple of location shoots and then two other warehouses that had to be um, emptied and then another set that had to be torn down. So, uh, huge. yeah, and so there's this massive scope of work. Um, where, where do you begin? Exactly. <laughs> uh, well, no, no, but, but what was your, so what was your first, um, what was your first, sort of line of uh, attack in terms of the rules and, and uh, how did you start to divide up, uh, divide and conquer, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't, it was really, so I was hired on a Thursday to start on Monday. And on Monday I met with um, the producer. I don't think they'd even hired, no, there was a UPM, but he was getting replaced. So there was a shift in um, leadership as well. Huh. Um, and then a few other people, I can't remember if they're still with us or if they kind of moved on, but because there was a, a shifting of the guard as well. Um, and we did a tour of all the sites and it was really surreal to just walk through these big spaces and be told, okay, now you're responsible for, <laughs> for this. You don't know anybody here and you have no idea what we do here, but this is, you know, you have to make sure everything is safe and COVID compliant. Um, and it, and it was really a lot of, um, just panic, I think, mm -hmm. <laughs> realizing that first day, like, what, uh -huh. oh, yeah, like, what have I done to myself? And what have I got myself into? Um, and then I just, I went with it. I mean, it was like, from the moment I opened my eyes till I fell asleep, just Zoom call, phone call, you know, talking to people, I had no idea what a gaffer was, or what anybody's <laughs> job description was, or really what the organization was. Um, the producers helped um, create a team for me because I didn't know anyone in production. Mm -hmm. um, so I was really the only one, the only medical person and everyone else uh, on my team was, was from production and they kind of knew each other. And, and can you talk about how you divided up some of that labor? 
Um, it was, they had a structure, the production company that I that hired me, that they wanted us to follow. But what ended up happening is I was the COVID officer, COVID compliance officer. So I kind of oversaw everything. Uh, and then we had um, the project manager who did, hired the PAs um, and did a lot of like the, the organizational work in terms of where everybody goes and how the stages work and what all the, the different film and production lingo means. And we had a project coordinator um, who'd already been on the show for um, working in the set design, um, mm -hmm. who, I mean, it was kind of magic. I do have to say coming from medicine, which everybody thinks is super efficient. It really isn't um, from medicine to film where I would just th say, well, we need some signs. And then someone's already printing them up. I mean, things happen so fast. Yes. Um, it was, that was, it was breathtaking. And I loved that aspect of it. Um, you can really so, get stuff done. It's, it's really helpful. good. Yeah. 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 It's helpful. And so I would have ideas or start having a discussion with someone and then it would be half finished by the time we were done having the discussion or, you know, so, so things were happening as we were creating them and learning the protocols because they hadn't really been flushed out by the production company. Um, like, like I said, the, the, um, the, the protocols hadn't been laid out and, and even the um, waiver hadn't been signed. There's a lot of legal components to it. So it was really waiver in terms of um, from the state or from well the the production had to get a waiver a legal waiver i think it was through the state mm -hmm. um and with the unions to be able to work until that finalized um um protocols were, were finished and they actually were just finished september 21st and uh wow that's so very <laughs> late in the game oh yeah uh, and they didn't even i didn't even have they didn't even have the training protocols set up yet um, when I started. So I was trying to figure out how to get trained while they were developing their systems and their protocols and setting up the protocols and learning can, production at the same time. Can you walk us through some of the um, changes or some of the I ideas that you had them implement? Um, like I imagine, like any production, they're just going to push through and say, okay, well, we want 200 people in this space. And uh, is, did that happen? And then did you have to step in at any time and say, well, actually, these are the guidelines that, that we need to implement? Yeah, I mean, I have to say that from, from uh, well, there's the production company and then my line producer was uh, fantastic. The line producer and executive producer really wanted to be safe first. Um, and when they were, because of that, they um, made sure I had conversations with the key people in the production before we even got started. So there were, there's a lot of discussion and uh, a lot of zoom meetings with, um, you know, people who would have made, would have otherwise had a lot of um, freedom creatively to be able to, you know, like have a hundred extras or have, you know, lighting or be really close to actors. So we had those discussions before anybody even came to New, York, to New York, the people that had to fly in. Um, and so there was that aspect of it, but there was also the production aspect of it. So our um, production company had protocols that they wanted us to follow, but some of them, like their rules said, you, you if you have background extras, they can't have hair and makeup, they have to do it themselves. Okay. Um, but our show needed hair, makeup, special effects, makeup, and these specialized costumes, and it was in water, and it was a massive set. So uh -huh. right off the bat, nothing in our show fit the waiver, the protocols from the production company, but it also, we couldn't just go ahead with what they had originally planned, you know, before they got stopped in the middle of it. And so, yeah, I mean, it, at a certain point, I, I'd ask, the production company, they say, well, ask your producers. And I ask the producers and they say, well, what's, what are we, what are we allowed to do? And then, so there was a lot of, you know, sort of thinking outside of the box. And I remember one day I'm like, well, how about this? <laughs> Again, having never worked with background actors um, for, for like the pod system for, um, cause we ended up having quite a few, um, but less than what they wanted, but a lot more than we were expecting. Um, and so I created this pod system and it, and it was, you know, I said, well, here's an idea. Uh, and I presented it and then everyone was like, oh, okay, I guess this is what we're doing. And then they just started doing it. <laughs> like, wait, it's actually working. So I had this, like, there's this huge um, space um, in um, that we, ha that was a holding area for the supposed, you know, hundred back back background actors that we reduced to 40, you know, and I walked through and I'm like, well, they could sort of be divided up like this. And then they, 
you know, had pipe and drape and chairs and tables. And I'm like, wait, it's actually happening. Um, and it ended up working out really well. And um, tell me about uh, why the pods? What 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 inspired you to to come up with the pod idea? Well, um, pods weren't my idea. That was um, something that the Safeway Forward had, you know, sort of created. And in theory, it's a great theory. And I think just like everything, um, you know, when people are sitting in a room thinking about it, theoretically things can sound great, but when you put them into practice, um, that's where you really find it where it's going to work and where it isn't going to work. And so the idea of having pods in a workspace where you know who's working and when they're working and, you know, it's the same group of people, like say in a law office or something, you like, you know, who's going to come to work, you know, where they're going to sit, you know, how to divide them up. I mean, that's one thing, but if, when you get, you know, to a television production where the people you're working with may change daily, um, you know, or you need them for certain days and not other days, um, it, the, it's just so dynamic. It's really hard to put that into um, functional, you know, functionally how to put it into play. And also in our show, there was, you know, there were certain things like keeping physical distance from one another that would make the work environment infinitely more dangerous. You know, like we had, I think the biggest crane in North America and it took, and there are all these huge, you know, there's so much equipment that it took, you know, a bunch of guys together working on, you know, because if they, you know, one person can't work on it, on their own right you know literally, literally you know, they all have to work in tandem yeah around <laughs> the thing to. yeah at the same time and it's more dangerous you know to have one person doing it than it is to have a group you know and it's sort of like weighing between that kind of you know physical injury and covid you know because it's it's easy to think covid is the only risk mm-hmm. um but on a you know on a television production what i learned too it's i mean it's unbelievable um, just how much heavy equipment and how much is happening all the time. And even, like I said, on our set, we had that huge pool. So there was that, you know, the wet slippage factor and, you know, people of different ages that had to be walked onto the set or it would have been too dangerous to just let them go by themselves. Sure. Yeah. And so is there, um, was there a guideline that you had come up with uh, for them in, in that circumstance in terms of like, um, PPE and, and exposure time and, and that kind of stuff? Yeah. So the general guidelines, I mean, everybody's heard them by now is to wear PPE, to stay at least six feet away from one another. Um, but also to not spend more than 15 minutes within, with, um, being closer to one another, um, that's less than six feet. So there's the distance component and there's the time component. Mm -hmm. And I tended to, to focus more to lean more towards the time, than this physical space. Um, and, um, and then in terms of, so that's kind of how the pods are developed, but it it also depended on exposure risk, um, specifically related to, uh, the actors when they couldn't wear PPE. So because the actors weren't wearing PPE, that was an increased risk. And so, um, the, um, the crew that was allowed to be next to them, we had to minimize the crew that was allowed to be close to them. Um, and then um, the crew that was in the same space um, that wasn't within six feet of them was also a different pod. And then there was another um, zone of people that would work on the set, but they weren't present when the actors were present if they didn't have PPE. It's complicated. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's complicated, yeah. And, and were who day to day enforced that? Were you on set? Um, I went to set every day uh, during the shoot, uh, mostly because I wanted to see how everything was working um, and adjust because like I said, a lot of the rules were theoretical and I wanted to see what was actually going to work and what wasn't. So I tended to make things a lot stricter in the beginning because human nature, they're just going to evolve away from those strict ideas. And also I think if you um, if you account for the fact that things are going to get lax as time goes on, then you can kind of end up somewhere that's still really safe if you start off stricter than pos- than sort normal. Of understanding <laughs> yeah. human nature, right? Yeah, yeah. And it was a lot of I think being a doctor was helpful in that too because I spent most of the time just explaining why, you know, not just saying stay six feet apart. I would explain why why you have to stay six feet apart or how COVID is spread or how aerosols are spread and ways to um, protect your immune system. 
Um, so there was a lot of just discussing as I walked through and talked to people. But I had a humongous team, huge team mm -hmm. um, of enforcers. Um, there was a, a second AD that was just there for COVID compliance. Um, we had a whole team of PAs as well as the project manager and then the uh, project coordinator. And we even had um, someone that was specifically uh, in charge of cleaning. Uh -huh. all the different sites. Yeah. Uh, well, let's let's get into some uh, specifics. Um, and um, we, uh, you can see comments, and I can see comments. Is that right? Yeah. All right. Good. So, if people have questions, we'll we'll get to them. Um, uh, testing. Um, I'm just going to ask a very uh, kind of deliberately basic question. Why why should you test? Uh, testing, I think, is key. Uh, absolutely, um, because. Um, but you have to understand uh, which tests you're using, what they mean, and put them in clinical to context in terms of whether or not the person has symptoms or not. So if you're just doing random testing, then you'll get a certain amount of information. But we um, ended up using a really accurate testing because we were filming in New York and the incidence of um, positive tests in New York was so low for so long that the more rapid tests were more likely to give us false positives than true positives. And so can you um, specifically, like if I want to go get a test right now, um, is there a certain kind of test that I should be looking looking to get for the highest degree of accuracy? Yeah, the most accurate test is uh, it's called a PCR nasal swab, but it goes to the lab. And so those are the tests that can take up to two weeks sometimes. And it's not like the test itself takes two weeks. It's that there's such a back backlog of performing the test um, that it takes, sometimes it takes a long time to get, but I think it only takes a few hours um, of amplification in the PCR machine before they can get the, the answer, mm -hmm. uh, before they can um, get the results. So, and I think it really only takes six hours from when you do the test, um, but because it's very expensive and there's that, that there's this, it's just hard to know when you're gonna get the test results back. Um, people tend to use that less um, but the rapid result, rapid tests of which there are many, um, you can get results back in as quickly as like five or 20 minutes, five, 15 minutes. Um, but those tests, I mean, none of these tests, none of them have FDA approval. Uh -huh. They all have emerg emergency authorization. Um, but their emergency authorization is specifically, um, for pa patients who have symptoms. So no one has really used these tests for screening and they were never approved as screening tests. They're approved to diagnose someone who has symptoms of COVID to see if it's COVID. I, so I, this is the first I, I've heard of that and that's uh, amazing information. It, it was always a little suspect. There was a nightclub here in Queens that was offering the rapid test as a way <laughs> for admission into the Forget test. It, right. And then they yeah. were like, you don't need masks because you've passed right. the test. Um, right. And that sounds even more insane after hearing your explanation than it did the first time. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, I think what people are realizing is that we are people, we're not lab tests. And the first thing we learn in medicine is you treat the patient, not the test. Mm -hmm. um, so everything has to be put into clinical context. And if you're, you know, if you're looking for, if you're trying to make um, an environment safe and make sure that nobody is contagious, which is what we're really trying to do, right? Um, then you have to ask if they have symptoms, but you know, people are so used to answering those questions now they don't really hear them. So you have to know if they have symptoms and do a test that has a really high accuracy. Um, and the rapid tests are, the accuracy is anywhere, they'll claim anywhere between 70 and 85, 90%. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I don't think that they've been done on a large scale or in a po population consistent enough to really come up with those numbers. And in practice, there's a lot of false positives so that someone will test positive, but they don't really have COVID. Right. Um, and, you know, the, with or without a mask, I mean, everything is just another layer of protection. So the test is, is one layer of protection or sort of knowing that you're not actively contagious. Wearing a mask is another um, layer of protection. Really good ventilation or being outside mm -hmm. is another one. Keeping your distance is another one. So, um, and I think in, a, in a, an environment like a production set, if you try to implement as much of that as possible, then you'll create the safest environment. But so, then there's a limit. So. Um, 
Yes, definitely. I can. I, I've been on set and and seen. You know, I I understand what it's like. It's not easy to wear a mask all the time wherever you are. Um, you know, particularly if you're sweating and working on on stuff. Um, but you know, you 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 have to do it. What were the what were the testing regimens? What were the um, PPE regimens in on your set? Well, the, the testing regimens were um, if you were within six feet of an actor when they weren't pairing PPE, then you had to be tested three times a week mm-hmm. with the nasopharyngeal lab PCR test because yeah. that was the most accurate. Mm-hmm. Um, but that ended up being 180 people, <laughs> which mm-hmm. is a lot. Um, be, and because we also had the 40 background and everyone who's in hair and makeup um, and even the costumers, cause they had these, you know, elaborate costumes that had to be taken off and on. So, um, we did a lot of testing for that. And then if people were on set, but not around, not close to the actors, um, then they were tested once a week and everyone who was on wrap was every, um, or strike was every two, once every two weeks mm-hmm. and people who worked from home or from, a, um, really either got in a pre-employment test or no test at all. Um, wow. but, but PPE, um, we had so much PPE because they just threw a lot of money at it. And at a certain point, I personally felt sort of sad because I thought about all those frontline healthcare workers who don't have any of this. <laughs> um, and they're actually getting exposed to people who are sick from lots of different reasons. Right. Um, but there was a lot of, I mean, there were KN95 masks, not the N95 masks. And there were cloth masks and people could wear their own so that masks. that was a question. Um, what's the most recent news on KN95s and their effectiveness? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the I mean, effectiveness is tricky, right? Because the CDC finally admitted again uh, that it's airborne. So it's aerosolized, meaning that if you are infected with um, COVID, with the SARS-CoV-2 virus, you can... Um, during a certain amount, you know, period of time, you can infect other people by breathing with aerosols. But once the virus is in the air, it can live in ventilation systems for months. And so it's not just people that get infected with it. People can get infected with it for a certain amount of time, but about a week, seven to 10 days, you're infectious, right? But buildings and places can also be infected with it, which is something we saw too. Um, One of the two true positives that we had was someone who came in from another state and didn't quarantine. Huh. But it, and it was a pre-employment test and it was a real COVID um, positive result. But this person had been in a state that hadn't seen the spike yet. Uh-huh. And, and then upon arriving to New York, <laughs> had the symptoms and, and a positive test. Uh, that's, that's awful for them. They, yeah. Uh, they would have to isolate here in New York, I would imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Funny enough, though, the isolation, if you test positive, is only 10 days, but quarantining, if you're exposed to somebody, is 14 days. It's longer. Huh. What's, and is there, what's the logic behind that? What's the, because there's an incubation period. Mm -hmm. So you can be exposed to it, but not start developing symptoms until a few days later. And so it's just, and it's a few days between exposure to. Shedding. Is that the word? Right shedding or shedding, shedding. virus? Um, yeah, it can be. So if you're exposed to somebody with COVID, you won't immediately catch it and shed it. It usually takes a couple of days before um, you know if you're going to be infected with it, which means so just so if you're around somebody who's actively infected with COVID, you're not going to automatically get sick from them. Mm-hmm. You have to have a certain amount of exposure and a certain amount of time with them to breathe in enough of their viral load. Um, And then that virus has to be able to live inside you for some reason. So you could be, you know, if you have a certain immune system, you could be around very sick COVID patients, COVID people, people with COVID, sorry, COVID people, um, people with uh, who are infected and not get sick yourself. But if you um, do get sick from it and it starts replicating in you, there's a lag of anywhere from two to 14 days before that starts happening. Uh Uh-huh. Uh huh. Um, which makes this um, particularly tricky. Um, yeah. Yeah. In terms of uh, contact tracing and and all the rest of it. Yeah, and that's why the term asymptomatic carrier. I was explaining that a lot to people because I think it's easy to think that you can walk around shedding the virus for like 
weeks and months, but that's not how it works. Um, if you're exposed and you are infected with it, the first few days, you may be shedding virus, but asymptomatic, meaning you don't know you're sick, mm -hmm. but then you're eventually going to get sick. And so part of the, would you do uh, a health check on people? Like, were you taking people's temperature? How, how, did, how did that work on a like day by day basis? Yeah. So our production company had, um, had a, uh, an app, it wasn't an application, sorry, it was a, something, it was a, uh, online mm -hmm. where every member of the cast and crew had to answer a series of questions. Mm -hmm. um, and then we were supposed to do manual temperature checks, which are really hard because any of the touchless temperature checks just aren't really that accurate. Uh -huh. We even beta tested this scanner um, that would read people's temperature as like 92, which wasn't uh -huh. compatible with life. <laughs> I, heard so I, think a, I heard a great yeah. story, by the way, of, of when they first started doing that, a worker um, came into the factory plant uh, with a hot cup of coffee. And, uh, and they, was this was before people realized that that would trip it up. And they're like, you need to go see the nurse. Your temperature is 102 <laughs> degrees, 108 right. degrees, you know. Um, yeah. uh, is temperature the best way to... Um, to to screen i mean is there no <laughs> what would what's yeah. i mean i think if 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 you wait until somebody has a fever mm -hmm. uh then you kind of miss the boat and you want to catch people who may be shedding virus before they're symptomatic so that they can't spread it or or even catch somebody who is testing positive before they're shedding and that's, that's why frequent testing is important when you're spending so much time with people in such a closed environment with that much exposure, right. you know, particularly for the actors. So they are, you know, and I think when we get back to the pods we were talking about before with the, the background, you know that they're going to be exposed to one another, mm -hmm. right? Because especially hair and makeup, because it takes a long time for them to do the hair and makeup and they have to be within six feet. Uh, and they can't, you know, do it for 10 minutes. They have to take as long as they take. So that's a known exposure. Um, and if you if you um, take into account that there is exposure on sets because you can't really have a production without exposure. I mean, you can, but we can talk about that in a little bit. But for most productions, there's no such thing as no exposure. Right. Um, so the more frequently you do testing, the more likely you are to catch somebody who becomes positive early in their disease course before they're contagious. And I guess uh, walk me, oh, Andy, so while we're on the subject of testing people when they first come in, Andy Turo's question of, uh, would you check with an oximeter? Um, and is that more reliable or less reliable? Yeah, and I mean, if you, usually the pulmonary symptoms of COVID-19 happen over a week into the illness, so if you've waited that long and you're catching somebody, you know, where their, their um, oxygen levels are dropping, then you probably exposed everybody. <laughs> like uh -huh. you don't want to wait that long. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, so I, walk me through when somebody tests positive. What, what is the procedure? Um, and did, did uh, apart from the one out of towner, um, did this happen on your job with all these people? <laughs> Uh, well, we didn't have any um, positive tests in our in our production, which was a miracle because I think at one point we we had tested like four hundred and something people, and our biggest test day was three hundred and twenty in one day, um, and that was fun to wake up at. The, I would get the results at five a.m. the next morning, and even I got so used to waking up, you know, worried. Yeah. <laughs> I wake up at like three thirty, like are the test results back? Um, but it, I mean, it's sort of a game of Russian roulette, right? If someone's going to catch it or not. But right. um, but yeah, nobody tested positive. I think mostly, um, I think there are a lot of reasons why though. Um, because New York already had that massive peak in the spring. Mm -hmm. The people on our show had already been exposed to one another last spring. So it wasn't really new people coming on. It was people who had been on the set in March. And I, I did a, just an informal survey and found that about a third of those people had definitely had COVID or had symptoms of COVID in March, yes. February, yes. March. Nobody had been sick since then, but the first COVID tests anybody had had was with us in August. Huh. And, you, and I was going to say, we were go on. Yeah, yeah, go on. Well, we were filming um, through the summer uh -huh. and the rates of positive, the positive rates um, in New York state were less than 1% the entire time we were filming. 
So I'm, I'm fascinated by that. Um, tell me, how does, uh, how does that make a difference that they've been um, exposed to each other? Um, you know, I understand, I think, if they've been exposed to the virus, um, is it fair to say that they, they have some level of immunity to being um, infected again? Yeah, and I think this is where we get uh, back into um, talking about the fact that it's airborne mm -hmm. and also the fact that once a virus is in circulation in a location, in a population of people, it doesn't go away. So it's not like COVID was here in the spring and it went away and now it's going to come back. You know, so people talk about like a second wave yes. and that second wave isn't recirculation of the virus. Like it's still here, mm -hmm. but what can happen is people who maybe like, there's that one guy in, in Trump's um, group that um, whose wife was sick yes. with the virus. Yes. 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 Yeah. And he Ste took Stephen care of Miller. her. Stephen, Stephen Miller. That's yeah, right. Yeah. So he took care of her. Um, and so they, they had presumed, you know, I don't think he'd ever converted to positive, but they had presumed, oh, he's exposed. He's not going to get sick from it. Right. And then he was exposed again um, with Trump uh, and all those people that tested positive. And it, they tested him um, for five days before his test turned positive. Now, but presuming that's a real positive, it's interesting. Right. So is it that he had it before and didn't get sick and had it again? Or is it which is more my theory that our immune systems, like whether or not we get sick really depends on our immune system, not just what we're exposed to. So maybe a few months ago, he was, his immune system was in a better state than it is now because things like, you know, not having enough vitamin D or not sleeping enough or having a lot of stress or whatever can reduce your immune system and make you more susceptible to getting sick. So I think like we're still, we've still been exposed to COVID. It didn't go anywhere. Right. But people getting sick now in New York, is it people who are coming in, you know, traveling in? Is it people who um, are working so much now that they're not sleeping and they're, you know, or are they having allergies that's making, that is like depressing their immune system and making them more susceptible to getting sick? Like there's a lot of different factors. Um, so I guess let me jump, I'm going to jump back to immunity in a second. But um, if somebody does test positive, uh, or if they did test positive, did you uh, did you have a plan in place, and and what was mm -hmm. the what was the procedure? Yeah, so our production company had protocols. Um, so before someone tested positive, um, which thankfully didn't happen, I went through that protocol, and that was to call their HR department, <laughs> um, who was, and it ended up being like actually an HR person. There was no one medical, um, and they had to um, email or consult with a doctor who was on retainer who worked in a hospital. So there was a delay of about five to eight hours or whenever that doctor decided to return the, you know, mm -hmm. the, the message. Um, and then based on that, they just on an individual basis would decide like who to, to, um, to uh, contact trace and who to shut down. Cause it happened on other shows. Um, and you know, it's not the best way of doing things. I think um, there are other shows who actually have someone medical doing the testing. Mm -hmm. So there's a doctor in charge of the test. So if it's if it's positive, then the doctor, you know, would, would put them in isolation, treat them, mm -hmm. you know, and monitor them, send them, you know, a referral to whoever, like an infectious disease or a pulmonologist, um, and then also help with contact tracing. Um, but that's why those zones in pods are important, mostly to minimize the number of people who have to quarantine if they've been exposed. So the idea would be, in terms of contact tracing, if if I test positive, it's the people that I that were exposed to me or around me uh, for more than fifteen minutes. Uh, what were what are what are some of the guidelines for your contact tracing? Yeah, so someone who you were in close contact with, so less than six feet for more than 15 minutes within 48 hours prior, which is a lot. Yeah. And would they then have to quarantine as well on, on your set or and in general? Right. So the person who tested positive would have to isolate for 10 days. Mm -hmm. And then anyone that was contact traced to, you know, that, to them would have to quarantine for 14 days. And some of these, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, they're not just uh, the studio 
regulations, but there's state regulations involved as well, right? This was a New York state production. And did you have to um, sort of connect the dots between the state regulations and the policies on set? Yeah, I mean, the policies on set were um, a little strange because they kept saying we're not diagnosing and treating, we're screening. So if somebody tested positive, they didn't want to verify it. Um, so I would think you would want to know if someone, if it was a true positive, because, um, this, the production company's policy was, uh, if someone's tests positive, no matter how the test is done, you treat it like it's real. Mm -hmm. Um, and then they have to isolate for 10 days. Then they can come back and they don't have to test again for three months. Uh, the theory is that they have antibodies. Is that their theory? The theory is that not necessarily antibodies, but the theory is that nobody who has had COVID uh, has gotten sick again for at least three months after they were first infected. But if you do the tests, there can be fragments of the viral particles in their system so they can get false positives after that. Even with PCR? It, um, especially with PCR because uh -huh. PCR, uh, and then to make it really complicated, <laughs> um, PC, PCR test, um, the way it works is it it's not even the whole virus. It's just like a fragment of a part of the genetic material. Uh -huh. um, and the PCR test um, is, uh, it's uh, they it finds a piece of that viral genetic material and then amplifies it. And the labs can amplify it 30 times, anywhere from 30 to 45 times. And, and then the results will be displayed as either positive or negative, but there's no consistency between labs in terms of the number of times they amplify the particles. So certain labs, there may only be, they may be less sensitive than others. And some labs amplify so much that you can get false positives where it may not be an amplification of that genetic material. And I. Uh, have we seen this on some shoots where they're doing pool testing? So that's different. Pool uh -huh. testing is even is even more interesting. Pool testing is great for screening populations when the results aren't going to have such uh, an important impact <laughs> and such a um, charged impact, right? So there was one show. So the way pool testing works is it's a way to reduce the number of cartridges that they use for um for rapid tests because they i think they're they're looking at a shortage of the cartridges for those abbott id now rapid tests mm -hmm. so to save uh on equipment they could take everybody they test say like 10 people's noses and they put all the material into one cartridge and then they run it and if it's negative then they assume everybody's negative Got but it. if it's positive then they have to go through and see which person was positive uh-huh and so this sounds like it's less desirable than individual testing, at least from your perspective. In this context, it's um, it's just it's just a recipe for like another Russian roulette sort of disaster because it's cheaper. So it's you know it's tempting to go the cheaper route mm -hmm. up front because the rapid tests are infinitely cheaper than the overnight lab tests. Mm -hmm. um, but I think in terms of what's at stake, it, it seems like it would be better to have something that's more accurate that you can um, rely on both for safety wise, for safety purposes and for shooting purposes. Uh-huh. Uh, yes, I, I think, I think I understand. I mean, I think it's, it's uh, a huge challenge and it's a huge uh, feather that nobody tested positive uh, to the procedures that you put in place. Um, can we talk about Im immunity and, and um, do, do people, individual crew people have um, a responsibility or, or a part to play in, in keeping themselves healthy? And if so, what, what are they and how can they help themselves? Yeah. I mean, I would only half jokingly, you know, because I'm a physician, I, we, we did these huge zoom meetings mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, and we had to do a safety meeting with every member of the cast and crew. And I would always tell them that they weren't allowed to get sick for any reason, mm -hmm. <laughs> not just COVID. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it, because of our, uh, with the filtration and our testing regimen and all the PPE, you know, once you've pre-screen everybody and everyone's negative, the only way um, someone is going to end up testing positive is if they bring it in from the outside. Mm -hmm. So if either they, their immune system gets so depressed that they catch it and spread it or 
if they haven't been exposed to it, you know, if they end up exposing themselves through someone on the outside. So what they did in their personal lives and their home lives ended up being even more important than what happened on the set. Right. Um, and I would also make recommendations about supplements to take um, and, you know, treating. Um, we had um, a lot of people were reacting to the chlorine in the pool. Uh -huh. um, so I was recommending that they take antihistamines, you know, and there are also like natural things that they could take um, to help boost their immune system so that they didn't, um, weren't as susceptible to getting sick, but it was hard, like on the location days and with really long hours and no sleep. Um, and, uh, yeah, like the food, there's just so much of it, but a lot of it just wasn't good for you. <laughs> um, there are a lot of places where their immune system, you know, would have been taxed. I think if we had to keep going. Um, do you feel comfortable uh, sharing some of the supplement recommendations? And I suppose uh, mm -hmm. we should add a caveat that this whole, um, you know, this right. whole seminar is is uh, is a uh, you should is one medical professional, medical doctors' um, practices, mm -hmm. and and people should consult their own medical doctor of course of course yeah um, yeah and it's and it's not i mean what i was what i would recommend is is just generalized anyway and obviously if you're going to take something you have to make sure that it's good for your body and it, there's no there's no reason to not take it thank you for um, being way more elegant about that <laughs> than i was it's like, uh, um but yeah I'm, I'm curious uh what uh what what supplements would you recommend or how you know what what's good for people yeah. I mean, the single most important supplement, and now they've done tons of studies to verify it, is um, vitamin D. Uh, so vitamin D um, is a uh, vitamin that you can overdose on it if you take too much. I have to say that too. But if you take it within um, reason, um, it's really important for people who live in colder climates or where they're not exposed to sun, um, especially, if, and even if they use a lot of sunscreen, because it, it, you can't, you can't, um, get it from very many foods or very few foods that have it. Uh, and the best way to get it is through direct sunlight. Mm -hmm. um, so um, in the spring, like the, one of the reasons people get so sick in the fall and winter is because their vitamin D levels drop. Huh. Um, so if you take enough, and I used to have tons of patients who I cured their recurrent sinus infections, for example, by just getting their vitamin D levels um, up to par. And I would do lab tests to check them obviously, but the vitamin D and having the appropriate amount in your system is key. Um, there's also, I also recommended, um, gargling with, um, half hydrogen peroxide, half water, not swallowing it, but gargling with it and spitting it out because it oxidizes bacteria and viruses in your throat, huh. which is where the virus likes to live. It also helps oxidize, um, bacteria for strep throat, for example. So it's helpful huh. for that. Um, other oils like oregano oil, I love, and there's a nasal spray that has it in it. You can get it online. It's called Sinu Orega. It burns, um, but you, if you drip it into your nose, it can go to your nasopharynx, which is the back of your nose, where again, where the virus lives. Um, and that is really helpful. Um, and then taking antihistamines if you have allergies or allergic symptoms, because it's hard, I think, you know, everybody now has to diagnose themselves, but if you're sneezing or coughing or wheezing, it's, it's easy to think that you're infected. Yes. But if you have bad allergies or you have a bad allergy exposure, then you can become more susceptible to getting infected by viruses and bacteria. Uh, your, your comment about wheezing um, reminded me of, of something that I've, I know when I fill out uh, always occurs to me. Um, you know, you fill out that survey you mentioned on the web and you certify that you've had no symptoms. Um, but that, oh, I mean, anybody, the symptoms they're asking about diarrhea or a headache, um, you know, anybody could have any one of those symptoms and it's not, um, you know, it's not necessarily meaningful in the context of COVID. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? And, and how did you handle the answers to those uh, questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, on my set, because everyone knows, I knew I was, I am a doctor, I keep saying I was a doctor, I am a doctor. Uh -huh. um, I got a lot more, a lot more um, phone calls about all kinds of symptoms. Um, and I, I know because clinically, I know what those symptoms in the context of COVID look like. Um, and so, you know, I had people that would call and say, I have X, Y, and Z. And I'd say, okay, you know, come get your test and then go see your doctor and get this test and get cleared. And then, you know, we'll see how you progress and then let me know how you do tomorrow. So we had some people like that. Um, yeah, people had a lot of symptoms to different things. Um, but, and I just use my clinical judgment to, 
determine if it sounded more or less like, you know, like COVID. Um, and nobody sounded like COVID actually. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, I would, you know, they saw their doctor, they got whatever test they needed to get, and then they would go through the testing with us and it was always negative. So it was just another layer of, um, were, were you aware? And, um, I suppose this isn't entirely fair, but were you under any pressure to be aware of, um, whether there was backup crew, if you send somebody, uh, you know, and told them they couldn't come to set, um, what was that like? Um, th- there was no pressure that way. I mean, I think, um, you know, like I said, for me, the most important thing was keeping everybody aware and healthy and safe. Um, and if somebody really was sick um, and contagious for anything, I didn't want them around anybody. Right. Um, because even if it wasn't COVID, I didn't want someone showing up with strep throat. You know, so I would say there was, I think there was someone like that where she was sick um, and I told her to stay home for that and get treated and she couldn't come back to work till she felt better um, just because you don't even want that being spread around the, the crew. But yeah, I mean, I think if we, if I was faced with a situation where it was a key person or, you know, like a lead actor or something, mm-hmm. um, then there definitely would have been a discussion with the production company, but, and, you know, I'm at no point would... I have said, oh, let's just put everyone at risk because we have to get this thing done. Yeah, I, I mean, mean I, that, never, yeah. I apologize to you and to yeah. our audience because I'm kind of jumping around a little bit, but that does bring up an interesting, um, I, I don't know, dilemma or issue, which is, um, was it helpful for you to be detached from production? I know, you know, you talked about how it was intimidating a little bit um, or new um, <laughs> at the beginning, but ultimately, did that help you? to be detached? I think so. I mean, personally, I think so. Um, I think it helped that I was used to making hard calls in my practice. So, I mean, with the patients that I was seeing in my office, I mean, I would have to call off, you know, pop star tours, you know, call up certain tour dates and I would have to, you know, pull lead actors from their shows. Or, I mean, there was one case where I had to shut down a show because there was no understudy. So I was used to that. Um, because again, like the, the, the patient to me is the most important thing. Um, but I think in terms of production, not really under, not knowing the hierarchy of things helped me mm-hmm. um, because I wasn't, you know, afraid to talk to X, Y, and Z. Um, and I think sometimes <laughs> it was, you know, I would say something and it was sort of this quiet, it, we had these huge Zooms and it was like, did you just say that to, you know, whoever? I'm like, was I not supposed to? Like, I didn't know the hierarchy of things, but, but learning who the key people were, um, were was also important because if you talk to the department head, they're going to have everybody that works for them. They'll listen to them. Right. You know, so understanding it to a certain degree, I think definitely was helpful, but I used my naivete in, in the production world, uh, to my advantage as much as I could mostly trying to get around, you know, like the rules. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'm going to jump back to set recommendations itself. Um, We touched Mm -hmm. on a a little bit, but can you talk about ventilation and the importance Mm -hmm. of ventilation on a set? Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially in terms of, you know, the thinking about this virus as being airborne or having a huge airborne component. I think ventilation is absolutely key. Um, And at the beginning of the pandemic in New York, when the governors and the, not just the governors, I guess everyone <laughs> was telling us to go home and stay home and shut the doors. I'm like, no, don't do that. Uh, because the more, because, um, because if you're infected with the virus and you're breathing in, in an enclosed space, mm-hmm. the more of a breathe out, I should say, breathe in and out. The more you breathe out, the more viruses you're going to expel. And then the greater concentration of virus you're going to have in that small space. So the more you can ventilate outside and dilute the air, the less likely you'll have a high enough viral load to infect you if you breathe in it. So MERV 13 filters are really um, popular now because they filter down to a micron size that's smaller than the coronavirus. And, and we should say that a MERV 13 filter is something that you put in your HVAC system. Right. right. People, it's a grade of filter that people normally right. don't use, but um, this has a particularly fine mesh, as you said. Exactly. Right. Most people, I think most buildings, if they even have filters are MERV 11, which are a little bit more porous, Mm -hmm. Uh, but MERV 13 filters are important, but they also, you also have to run the HVAC through them. So you can't just have a filter without the ventilation running. 
Um, and you also don't need the cool air on to have the ventilation running through an HVAC. Um, but it, and um, and the air should be recirculated as much as possible. So where we were working, ninety percent of the air was recirculated every hour. Uh huh. Ninety percent of the air in the space. What, what, um, in the space. And was there um, talk of bringing in fresh air, or is it was it sufficient to recirculate the existing air through the MERV thirteen filter? Um, I I guess my perspective was recirculating through the MERV thirteen was minimum was the mm -hmm. minimum we should do. Mm -hmm. um, and and luckily we we um, shot when it was nice outside. So we had the doors and windows open as much as possible. So we used a lot, as much um, that we could do outside. We did as much as we could outside, which included testing, um, even when we were on location, you know, eating outside, um, holding areas or outside if we could do it. Um, yeah, so the more uh, the more outside dilution of air we could use, the better. Even dry, even in cars and transportation. Uh, uh, in, interesting. And so, tell tell me about. Um, did was there a lot of crew transport uh, on on your job, and did you have specific recommendations for that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there were. Uh, yeah, there. Yes and no. I mean, it was more just the private cars. So um, there wasn't. We didn't. I guess recommend carpooling. People did it on their own. Um, but when we had, um, if someone was getting transportation, it was usually one person in the back of a car with the driver in the front, both had PPE on and the windows down. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they even put a plastic divider between the driver and the passenger, and there was no contact between the two. Um, and the vans were a little trickier because our production company only wanted two people in a 15 person van, which mm -hmm. is, you know, like the whole six feet of distance thing. Um, and then some, you know, other production companies want one person in a van and some will allow for four. Um, but again, if you have, you know, the air circulating, that also helps. And then um, buses, um, we allowed 23 people on a 46 person bus. So it was every other seat, you know, one person in a row. Uh huh. Ha ha oh, okay. Yeah. So half ish uh, capacity. Yeah. Um, were there different PPE requirements when you were shooting indoors versus when you were shooting outdoors? And if so, how come? Um, the PPE requirements weren't weren't based on indoors or outdoors. Mm -hmm. um, I found that uh, again because of human nature, if people get into a pattern, it's best to just keep them in that pattern. And so, even though you know, if you're outside on a beach you know, it isn't like wearing uh, a mask. It isn't as critical um, as it, you know, when you're indoors um, breathing in someone else's um, air, aerosol. So, um, <laughs> but then if people are just used to wearing masks, then just wear your masks. Um, but the different types of PPE were more based on proximity to another person who isn't wearing anything, you know, so the actors. Really, yeah. the only people that like that were the actors. And then I do have to mention something about goggles, though, because it's kind of a pet peeve of mine. Sure. Um, a lot of sets are recommending that everyone wear goggles, too, um, which is a little, which is overkill in the wrong direction, right? So they, they'll be lax about things like ventilation mm -hmm. and cramped spaces, um, but they'll be really vigilant about goggles. And goggles are meant to be used in settings where someone, like you're a healthcare worker, and you're doing surgery or you're with a patient who's coughing or sneezing so that you don't get no one coughs or sneezes in your eyes. Mm -hmm. So you don't get the saliva hitting your eyes. And that's why at the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of eye doctors and ear, nose and throat doctors like myself were getting very sick because the patients were coughing and sneezing in our faces. That's what that PPE is meant for. But if you're a cameraman and you're 20 feet away from, you know, the person that you're shooting and they take off their, in their mask, you're not going to, catch COVID from them and your wearing goggles doesn't protect the other person. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Interesting. All right. Um, yeah, I've seen different requirements for face shields. Um, yeah. Somebody came in saying their job allowed them to wear glasses, but they needed the side um, covers to be, to be able to wear glasses on set. Um, so I've seen yeah. it all over the place. Yeah. yeah. And there's really no, I mean, if you're around someone who isn't wearing PPE, um, you can wear goggles or a face shield um, if you're in proximity to them, mm -hmm. if, if you're afraid that they're sick and they're breathing on you. But right. if you're testing that frequently, it isn't necessarily that important. 
but the goggles don't protect the other person. And if you're really far away from them and everyone's wearing PPE, then there's no reason to wear them. And six feet, is that still the kind of guide, the kind of litmus test or guideline? Um, yeah, I mean, the six foot thing, um, it's six feet and at least 15 minutes. So okay. I'd like to think about it backwards. Like, how, what would you have to do to get sick from someone? who has COVID. <laughs> so mm-hmm. someone's actively shedding virus. The best way to catch it is to get as close to them as possible for as long as possible. Um, and some of the CDC regulations that were, or I guess information that was emailed, I have something from February um, where they were talking about um, ways to avoid catching it. They were saying, you know, when your patient comes in, if they have COVID, this is how it was written, if you can believe it. Um, if they have it, make sure that you ventilate the space and just don't stay in the room with them for too long. Cause the longer you're in the room with them, with them coughing and sneezing, the more likely you are to contract it and get sick from it. So that's where the six foot thing comes from. It's really in the context of healthcare workers, um, and in a healthcare setting, which is, really sad if you think about, again, the pandemic, everyone was told to stay home. And then when they went to the hospital, they went to the hospital and they were all sitting in this closed ERs and these closed spaces yeah. with recirculated air and healthcare workers that had very little PPE. So talk about maximizing exposure. It's like the worst places to go. Petri and, dishes. You know, at the height of like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And yeah. And that's where a lot of those regulations came from that. And also math labs, like aerosol math labs. Nobody still has done a study because it's unethical <laughs> of somebody who is actively sick with COVID, like the the viral load that you would need to make another person sick. Like they can't do that study just because it's unethical. Sure. Yeah. Uh, in other words, how sick do they have to be before they? Yeah. Like no one, no one can really put that six foot distance rule to the test. Does because those. Those, those parameters were created based on just aerosols in mathematics labs. Does uh-huh. that make sense? I see. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah. I, and I've seen those kind of animations and, and uh, um, yeah, and there's conflicting uh, information. This is now stepping away from film sets necessarily, but, um, you know, uh, jogging or biking out in the city, um, you know, what's the what's the rule for that? And And I've seen the math lab simulations of, um, you know, how it can go behind them. And, and um, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I, I wear a mask just to show I wear a mask uh, when I'm outside. Um, mm-hmm. You know, here I keep 12, 12 feet of distance. And if somebody comes up, I put a, a mask on. Um, mm-hmm. I would say this is a good segue to kind of talk generally about production office protocol was, did you go to the production office and did you um, make any recommendations for them? Yeah, they, they, um, we didn't have a place to work really. (laughs) I mean, there were some offices, but we put one or two people in an office, um, at the stage when we were shooting, but the main production office, we emptied out as much as possible. So it was really just uh, two departments. Um, and then we limited the capacity to less than 50% of, um, whatever the building capacity was, the New York state regulations were that it had to be at less than 50% of regular capacity. Um, they had to have room for 13 filters with ventilation and, and the windows open. And then when they were, when they were at work, I made them wear masks um, unless they were alone in an office. A couple of questions about uh, just ventilation again. Did you allow smoke on your set or fog no. or any atmosphere? How, how come? Uh, Cause because that can cause coughing which is exactly the thing you don't want. Uh-huh. Uh, because it's, it's, uh, it, it can be an irritant. Which is also, I really want to talk about this, is the, yeah. the fogging, right? Yes. So there are companies, um, and I don't even know, because this was set up before I even got there, that, oh, we have to do this misting, sanitizing of, you know, it's not fogging, it's misting. Um, but fogging is specifically prohibited by the CDC to treat the virus. Mm -hmm. Um, They don't say why, but they say it's, it's prohibited, but a lot of the, um, the chemicals that they use for fogging, if it's a small enough particulate size can affect your lungs adversely. So it can be really bad for you to breathe in. And we had people react to it actually. Uh So that one of the companies wasn't using fogging, they were using um, these sprays. So it was a bigger particulate size, but it was the same chemical. And people were getting like inflammation of their lungs and asthma and coughing from the chemicals 
Um, and they're really not supposed to be doing anything like that. You're supposed to just ventilate with clean air or recirculate the air through the filters. Well, should not and, recirculate. Yeah. and then wipe off surfaces. Yeah. And so uh, let's get into some cleaning stuff. The funny thing I've heard about fogging is um, as sound people, uh, we don't necessarily want that stuff on our gear. And so we end up nope. covering our gear anyways, which kind of yeah. you know partially defeats the purpose. Same, I'm sure, with the camera department. Um, oh, and so, it corrodes, even in the construction shop, it was corroding, you know, a lot of the equipment in there too. So I ended up um, looking into it. Um, it was like one of the um, producers was questioning it. Mm -hmm. And so I looked into it more, for, you know, more thoroughly and I was like, you know, we really shouldn't be using it. So we, we ended up stopping. In, it's really just surface cleaning. Interesting. So, um, and surface cleaning, uh, still the science, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, um, supports uh, soap and water for a lot of the, and yep. there's guidelines about how long um, if you use alcohol and what concentration. Um, did you make uh, recommendations uh, around that? Yeah, for every department, yeah. <laughs> for costumes, yeah. hair and makeup, sound, everybody. Um, because the virus um, has a hydrophobic outside, which means it has sort of a fatty layer. So mm -hmm. soap um, is an emulsifier. And so that can break down the outer layer of the virus. So things like heat and steaming don't kill it, don't get rid of it. Mm -hmm. um, but soap is really effective and, and at least 70% alcohol. Um, so, and I think a lot of what the costumers were doing before they could continue doing, um, cause I think they said they used, they would spray the costumes with vodka or dilute vodka. So they just switched it to, to, um, ethyl alcohol. Uh -huh. Um, but yeah. And then as much single use as possible and, and again, surface wiping. So even just wiping off with, um, 70% ethyl alcohol for microphones, for example, um, can kill whatever's on the surface. I, I learned a fascinating fact about that, which was, I was like, well, if 70% is good, 90% is better. And that's actually completely false because you need it to stay on. Is that right? You, you, yeah. Yeah. 90% evaporates. Will evaporate. Yeah. It evaporates. Yeah. Um, well, we, we, uh, we should, I'm going to look through some questions and, and if people have questions, um, please type them in. Um, uh, Ken uh, Gooden um, says, doesn't the filter also cause the HVAC to push air harder and therefore get louder? Um, I have, I've heard that the, the MERV 13 filter does make the HVA system work harder. Um, mm -hmm. it's interesting, New York having a funny kind of variety of quote unquote stages. Um, there are some mm -hmm. stages where they keep the air handling on all the time, or, um, I've heard of air scrubbers being brought in. Um, but on those stages where they keep the air on all the time, even when they're shooting, um, the mixer has had to talk to post-production and say, Hey, mm -hmm. this is a result of COVID and, and, uh, here are some noisier tracks. Yeah, um, exactly. And air scrubbers are really loud too. Yeah. Air scrubbers, I've heard, um, they can, they turn off during just when they're rolling and then turn them right back on. Um, but That's yeah. One way, yeah. Um, what did, did you guys have air scrubbers on your sets? Um, we, we had air scrubbers in places that we couldn't get MRF 13 filters, but not on, and not anywhere that we were shooting. Mm -hmm. Um, Andy turret says 0.05% hydrogen peroxide is what a lot of us use. Um, and, and Andy, um, on equipment, I'm, I'm assuming, um, to, to wipe it down. Is that, is that, would you agree that that's effective? Yeah. Okay. I would. I mean, that's not one of the CDC's favorite recommendations, but it's, I love it. Seems, it seems okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I'm just looking to see, um, uh, uh, the job I'm on now uh, I test every day. I feel like that's made me feel safest. Um, not the temperature checks that read like 95 mm -hmm. a lot. Right. Um, yeah. And then sort of like, um, talking about the makeup of COVID compliance teams, um, you know, sh is there in your mind, um, should it always be a medical doctor that's at the top? Um, is, is it okay to have an EMT or somebody with other training or what, what would you recommend if, if a producer, um, you know, went to, to book you, but you were busy, who, who would you tell them to go find? Yeah. I mean, I actually think, um, there's, there's two models. Um, one, um, that I saw was that the testing was run by a doctor and, and their personnel. So they kind of 
dealt with all the medical component of it. And then there were like a COVID compliance team that were more like um, safety regulations. So they did like the signs and the spacing and they were like the police. They walked through and they were the police. So that was one model um, that had its, pros, had its pros and cons. In my position, I sort of did both. Like we had a testing lab, but I ended up, like we had to do all of the, um, the project manager actually kept, she kept track of it, um, who had to test and when they had to test. Um, I was responsible for working with the lab to get all the supplies and streamline the experience of testing. Because if I left it up to the lab, it would have been a mess. Mm -hmm. um, and I was, I was also sort of acting as the doctor to the set um, with diagnosing and making clinical decisions. But if I had had more um, if I had the ability to be in charge of the testing, I think it would have made it just easier for me <laughs> to do. Um, but I think moving forward, and I've been asked by, by different productions to do this for them, um, that I think it makes more sense for me or a doctor who's interested to um, be in charge of setting everything up so that their teams can carry it through and then being on call to answer questions. Because mm -hmm. it's, I don't think, I mean, a lot of times I don't think I was necessary, you know, on the day-to-day -day operations, unless there's a problem. I mean, I was always there for tests. I was, I did go to the whole shoot. I was there all the day for the shoot, but like right. now that really isn't very much for me to do because we're winding down. So I don't think, you know, keeping a full-time CCO who's medical is, is necessary for one production, but maybe like to be sort of in charge of helping design um, the structure sure. and then having people kind of carry it through on a day-to-day -day basis, I think would be a more efficient use of time. What, um, what sort of future, uh, oh wait, uh, K95 is rated for eight hours of exposure. Um, yes, um, that's true. And so you, would you, you'd recommend swapping out masks? Uh, is that right? Um, I mean, so then that's where like the production companies, the CDC, the state, everyone has their own um, perspective on that. And also, I mean, I should say that the can't, none of the masks are a hundred percent effective at filtering out this virus because the micron size of the virus is so small. Um, and the N95 mask, which is the heavier duty one mm -hmm. was actually created for tuberculosis, which is 4,000 nanometers and um, coronavirus is only 125. Uh -huh. So it's really tiny and there's always leakage. So, I mean, theoretically you can use those KN95s for five days or, or if they get wet. Um, but I mean, whatever makes you feel more comfortable, but actually those surgical masks are more effective than the cloth masks. Uh -huh. Um, Huh. And, and again, and it's only test, it's only um, protecting you from aerosol spread, not from airborne virus. Right. And air and the virus gets airborne by projecting coughing uh, when people are unprotected. Is that right? Right. Or but through then the through the ventilation. Right. And once it's in the air, um, you know, whatever isn't like, sometimes it lives on surfaces, sometimes it dies, sometimes it stays in the ventilation system. And, and so when people talk about like whether or not you can catch it from, you know, getting a piece of mail, yes. like that's harder. Yes. Um, but, but I'm sure, I mean, it, I think those super spreader events are really more a result of the airborne nature of the virus than one person coughing on a bunch of people. Because like, for example, one of them was like, I think it was a church or something where someone was singing and everyone was singing for hours and all that air, like it makes more sense that that air was getting recirculated because people way in the back were getting sick mm -hmm. too. They got sick too. So it wasn't just the person in front projecting you know, 50 feet. It was them projecting in their space and then the air getting recirculated and recirculated and recirculated. Without the proper filtration. Without the proper filtration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. I, um, and that I think is really one of the... Um, things that that's a, one of the tragedies of, of the performing arts, the live performing oh, arts is when it involves that kind of live singing. Um, yeah. uh, Cujo, um, CCO is supposed to have the power to pull the stops and shut it down. Yeah, I totally mm -hmm. agree. Theoretically. Yeah. yeah. I mean, but it's hard. I mean, if everyone comes from production, it's really scary and it's, and, and it's hard to get um, the higher ups to listen. And it's also a little bit, funny in the sense that it's the higher ups that recommend you for work. Uh, like, yeah. you know, like, Hey, they, they did a really good job. I mean, I would, I would hope that that would include like, yeah, they shut us down when it was too dangerous. They did a really good job, 
but you know human nature again it's it's a yeah. it's a challenge but I think it's also like there's the production, but then there are also like the directors and cinematographers and like, you know, people who are not necessarily the producers, mm -hmm. you know, so say the director is just, I don't want to deal with this. Like it, we, that was on one of the productions. Um, the CCO was complaining that the, that the director just wouldn't listen to anything he said. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's an issue. I mean, it, it's, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the hi the hierarchy has to be. Um, I'm reminded of uh, the uh, the checklist uh, by Atul Gawande. Um, you know where the nurses had the final say, kind of, um, mm -hmm. in and could shut it down. I mean, it's kind of, it kind of has to be the same idea, I think. And I, yeah, I'm with you, Kujo. Um, do you agree that beards are essentially irrelevant because there is no 100% effective mask, anyways? Some people have complained that production is forcing men. Uh, to shave because of COVID and masks. Yeah, we. I was told to have my cast and crew shave, and I mentioned it at first. Only one person actually did it, uh, and then after that, I actually, if you think about it, yeah, there's no perfect seal. These masks are not perfect seals, but in some ways, your beard can sort of filter as well, and it almost forms a better seal with these masks. So I didn't make anybody shave. I think it's. I don't think there's any reason to do that. Uh, in, nice. Fascinating. Um, I know of two CCOs that quit because the producers were strong arming them in a dangerous environment. Career is dented for sure, but the crew appreciated it. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the bottom line and, and, um, you know, we've heard stories of, um, you know, when a crew didn't speak up, uh, when they went to, a, uh, they suddenly found themselves in a location that was clearly too small. Um, mm -hmm. and the crew walked away feeling, uh, you know, very uh, upset. I mean, it, it just, mm -hmm. and angry. Um, you know, they shouldn't you know, have been it, there. Yeah, it takes a lot. I mean, I think a lot of it uh, is personality. Um, and I love to talk to people. And when people were upset, because people got upset about a lot of different things, mm -hmm. I, I asked, you know, I had conversations with them and asked them what was upsetting and what they were concerned with and what scared them. And oftentimes they had really great ideas for how to fix things. Um, which we listened to and implemented, or it was just my explaining why it, it wasn't dangerous or, you know, sort of um, why it wasn't a risk if they thought it was, and that made them feel better too. But I think communication is absolutely key, but it would be hard, you know, if I wasn't a doctor who treated, you know, COVID patients and ear, nose and throat patients, it would be hard for them to trust what I was saying too. Um, so yeah. I think it was helpful that way because i really again like i'm a doctor first right. um and i really would get you know very protective of the people that i'm responsible for so in that sense it's good that i wasn't in the production world because you know if they never hired me again i was like fine yeah, <laughs> but it was it's like oh i've got another <laughs> i've got yeah. another career um but i think i mean obviously you want to have a good rapport with people but you do get squeezed i mean you you it's it's a really hard position because no one really likes you you're either telling them no you know or you're um you know restricting them or you know sister like, you're talking to people in the sound department so we're, <laughs> like, we're used to that you yeah, know, yeah. No, yeah, no, or you're uh, costing them more money or yeah, yeah i mean no, that's uh yeah that's welcome to the sound department yeah uh, you have to embrace yeah. that yeah yeah no i mean i think there's a there's a personality that can that can you know can handle work, work it, yeah. that yeah and and yeah. and make it part of what they want to do too okay. um mm -hmm. but yes um uh, we have gone, I think this is one of the longest, uh, live streams we've ever done. And, um, I mean, I, I feel bad, uh, and ending it, but, uh, it's an hour and 21 minutes, which is awesome. Um, if people have follow-up questions, can they kind of funnel them through us and, and sure. do you mind, sure. um, maybe we'll Not do a follow-up All right. Um, Dr. Linda Dahl, thank you so much. Uh, for, for taking the time and for answering our questions and sharing your stories. Will there be a study? Um, do you think with all that data, you must have this rich um, set of data? I do. Um, I've been trying to write op-eds to see if anybody wants to publish it. But um, but yeah, I think it's hard. It's not controlled studies. It's really more just observational. But yeah, I mean, I'm planning, a, I'm writing a, a bunch of articles and seeing like who wants to publish them. Super real world though. I mean, it yeah. doesn't get real. Uh, it doesn't. <laughs> awesome um thank thank you so much i've actually lost the end 
uh, stream button, which is kind of hilarious. <laughs> um, so uh, I will sign us off. And thank you so much. Thank you for watching. Thanks stay for healthy. Me. Stay healthy, everybody. Be well. Bye.